Hi, my name is Natasha Mateyer, and I'm the owner of JMTY Jewelers. Hey, it's Kellen, and today on Diversified Game, this is a first for me. I love first. I have Natasha, and she's going to give us the game on JNCY Jewelers. And yes, it's she makes jewelry. Yeah, you don't have to, for those minority who watch the game, you don't have to like redo your eyes like the cartoons <laughs> did. She is that chocolate, and she is a woman, and she does do jewelry. She makes it. She's shown some pieces, and it's on her website, whether you are listening or are watching, you can go check in the description box and check out her website. What's going on, madam? Because jewelry game, first of all, are you, I have to ask, are you a Jew, Hasidic Jew or another type of tribe of Jew? Because usually Jew, Jewish and males are in the jewelry game heavy. So how did we get here if you're not Jewish? Because, you know, there are mm. Black Jews out there. Yes, that's uh, true. <laughs> Yeah. And so give us the game on like how you got into this and, and su started, sustained and succeeded. OK, so no, I'm not Jewish. Um, so the way that I got into the industry is not very conventional. <clears throat> I didn't work for a jewelry company. I wish I did. That's one of the things that if I could give anybody advice, try to work at a mom and pop but I'll give that advice later. Um, but I started because I was working for an, a company, an uh, insurance company, because originally my degree is in risk management and insurance. So I'm definitely far away from that degree. I worked on that degree since I graduated college up until 2020. Um, the company that I worked for previously, um, basically they, we got a new, or they got a new CEO and that new CEO had a different plan and was shutting down offices left and right throughout the United States. So to give you the picture, the company that I worked for had an office for claims in every county of every state in the United States. And they went down to having only three. Um, <clears throat> so once we got the announcement that our office was not selected, the CEO did give us five years versus like a two week notice. So in that five years, I was able to really like develop myself the first three years. I thought it was a joke. I didn't think that the company would do a company wide layoff. And then from there, once I started to see upper upper management leave um, people that's making like 300K plus leave, I was like, OK, they're really going to shut us down. So. I read the first book that I read that sparked my interest was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And originally I wanted to do real estate. As I was reading the book, one key gem that he said in the book is wealthy people usually, instead of thinking of like a job to make money, to buy something, they think of what stream of income can I create to buy this product so am I going to sell a book to buy this home am I going to start this business to start so I was like well let me start a business thinking it was like super easy um and from there I'll start buying real estate property so I thought to myself what kind of business should I start and because I wanted to be different I said okay well everybody sells hair in my community everybody has a boutique no one that I knew of was selling jewelry. Um, I was wrong because I thought, you know, just like the costume jewelry. So I was like, okay, let me just do that. I started doing my YouTube university homework. And originally I just went to Alibaba and bought some pieces. But when I tested out the pieces, because the way that I think of any item is you need to test out the item like your worst client, meaning somebody that's not going to follow the rules that you told them of, you know, putting the jewelry up, don't take a shower in them, don't go to the pool. So I started to realize that it tarnished. So I said to myself, there has to be a vendor locally because the all of these jewelers throughout the United States are not making it themselves. So through that research, I found a company locally well, in the United States that allowed me to purchase um, diamonds, colored gemstones, solid gold. And originally my 
goal was just to get solid gold. It wasn't really even to get diamonds. So I found that company and I had a key thing was, was my resale license. And with that resale license, they allowed me to open up an account and they gave me $2,000 in memo. So in the jewelry world, they allow you to borrow pieces on a thing called memo for like between, depending on what the piece is, between five to 30 days. Um, so I went ahead and, you know, I didn't even know if this company was real. And now this company has been around for so many years. They're the number one jewelry um, company or jewelry wholesaler in the United States. So I remember I got my first package from them. I just got some random pieces. My brother was like, do you think this is real? Because why would they just send you these pieces? So I was like, I don't know. I mean, I saw them on the internet and it says it's real. And um, I remember the first time I got a diamond and with a diamond, they give you only five days and it had a GIA report. So then I was like, okay, they might be credible. So after I got that diamond, and I got the GIA report, I went ahead and researched GIA, learned what every part of the report meant. And then at that time, I already had an Instagram. I went on Instagram and just taught people what I knew from my research. And then from there, I just started posting. And what I would do is I would return the diamond back and then I would get another diamond because I only had $2,000. So I couldn't get anything really big but I was just able to get pieces, show people that I was able to get different styles, cuts and colors of diamonds and gemstones. And from there, just using the right hashtags, I then was able to get a following. I would, you know, um, promote on certain pages, run Facebook ads, and someone asked me to make them an engagement ring. And so I didn't know how to do it. I was like, yes, I'll do it. And again, I went and did my research. And from there, I made the first engagement ring and then I showcased it. And then from there, I made another engagement ring. And all of this happened in 2019, 2020, because I started in 2019. 2020, you know, of course, the pandemic happened. So I was very limited on who I could get to do the jewelry for me. Um, thankfully, that company was able to do it. But then once the pandemic kind of lessened, I was able to come locally to my diamond district, which is um, the Seabold um, in downtown Miami. And from there, I made connections with certain people. And then from just making engagement rings, I was able to make custom pieces. And then um, I met a mentor who, to this day, he's... Um, very helpful, a great person. Um, he has taught me how to use the microscope correctly, how to grade diamonds. Um, he has helped me source watches. So I would say what has helped me sustain is one, having knowledge, the thirst for knowledge, two, meeting the right people and continuing those relationships, and then three, being social on social media. Mm. So, so much here. And I'm gonna let the audience know, I could talk to you at least half a day about the questions. But that's why when she writes her book, or does her own podcast, <laughs> we got we got to leave something. For I definitely that. want to do a podcast. Yeah, we're gonna talk. We're gonna talk after this. But I gotta I gotta give the, the, the game for that person who says, wow, this sounds so cool that I have a creative mind. Maybe I'm an artist and then someone else who's more, you know, with the metals, they could make it that for me and I can kind of design it. What, what type of um, creator are you? Are you drafting it out on paper and then giving it? Are you even learning how to, you know, twist those metals and cut those diamonds as well? Okay. So because uh, the way I'll answer this question, because I didn't know anything about the industry when I got into the industry and I decided to become a jeweler versus someone that just resells jewelry. I took every course that you can think of. I did take bench classes, but it's not a hundred percent for me. I do want to continue so I can know how to do certain things like um, setting diamonds. 
I did get up to that part of setting stones, but I never completed that part. I currently have two of my brothers in that because they're more technical with their hands than I am. Um, I did take the computer classes. Um, so I do sketch. Um, the computer work I don't do. I have someone on my team. The best way to grow, especially as a small business, is to realize that you can't do everything and then to allow the people who are experts to do it so that you can continue to retain your clients and bring in more because there would be no way if I'm making the pieces all day that I could be on social media or that I can network. Um, so I just found the best talent that I could find and allow them to bring the pieces to life. Um, of course, with my creative direction, so I have to have the eye to say, okay, no, I don't like the stones this big or this prong is missing because they just go based off of your direction. Um, so in a nutshell, I could do all of it, but I choose not to so that I can scale my business better. No, and you're not supposed to. You hit it right on the head. That is game. If you guys don't hear anything else, that you need a team to make the dream happen. So many entrepreneurs struggle for decades not getting that part. And it's because they don't want to share the money, even when they make it. You know, I know people making six figures a month refuse. They'll go to their grave before they have to hire a full team to take it to a seven figure a month. So yeah. uh, you are you're definitely, you know, thank you for sharing that piece of the game. Now, for those who love bling bling, and you know, a lot of us in our community love some bling bling. Yeah. Can you talk about the quality versus the bling bling everyone's gonna say ooh la la because it looks like you have a hundred grand on your pinky but it might be 57 dollars worth of <laughs> you know diamonds which hey there's no no nobody should care whether your stuff is real or fake be, unless they're trying to rob you right, right. Uh, so it doesn't matter but can you talk about just the different like i could make you something that looks fantastic and it's on our website folks and it, and you might be like how'd you get that pair ring i saw that in zales for ten thousand dollars like just talk about that because too many of us are, are trying to have champagne taste but have beer money yes so i would say one of the main first misconceptions is i think in our community a lot is that you need to have a vvs diamond um, because that's everything that the rappers talk about, which there's nothing wrong with VVS. Um, VVS is a good quality, but when you look at diamonds, there's different components of it that allows it to look the best. So you have the four C's, which is the cut, color, clarity, and carat weight. And the focus, especially in the rap music, is always on the clarity and not at the other parts where the cut is what gives you the light reflection. And the reason why I know this is because I'm studying for it. So going back where I said my thirst for knowledge, I didn't want to get into the industry and not know what I was speaking on so that when I get a client and you have that deer caught in the headlight look. <clears throat> but to go back to answering the other part of the question is, there are some, so many things that you can do. You can get um, diamond substitutes and not necessarily like a fake diamond, but you can get something like white topaz, which will still give you the look of a diamond without having to pay that price. It won't have that sparkle, um, but you'll get that look if that's what you're going for. You could do a white sapphire as well. Um, there is also the option of lab diamonds, which so many people choose it for different reasons. One is cost because it's going to cost you like a fraction of what a natural um, diamond costs. Um, you can also do it for, um, for the eco-friendly reasons. Some people are so, you know, caught up. Well, not caught up, that's not the right rule. So, so many people are focused on saving the earth so that, you know, they don't want to go and get something that is in the earth and that's already drilled. And then there are, I've had clients that are of African descent and they don't want anything to do with blood diamonds. So they choose lab. Um, you can also choose um, moissanite, which is another 
diamond substitute moissanite in itself is a different stone, but a lot of people use that as um, a stone for their custom pieces or their engagement rings. Um, it does sparkle a little different from diamonds, but those are the different options that you can have. And then you just choose what you want from there. It, now with the, the moissanite and you're getting that look and as some of us, that's all that it's about, right? You're trying to yeah. impress. Uh, and there's a time and place for everything. So no judgment at all. But with that, you have like, can you get the fattest, you know, Bishop Don magic wand ring <laughs> in Moissanite. And what should people look at so they don't get ripped off? Because people also get ripped off off the lab made stuff and they yeah. pay more than they should when you're like, man, you got about a hundred dollars worth on you and you paid how much? Two thousand. You bought it in the middle of the mall by some guy who, you know, is a great salesman. So how can they kind of find out what their jewelry is worth, whether it's Moissanite, Moissanite um, or a VBS diamond that rappers have rented jewelry. Y'all, Rappers yeah. usually retire like athletes broke because unfortunately they don't have financial literacy that's why we do shows like this so give us the game on if i see a moissanite ring how do i know if i should pay a hundred dollars for it or if i should pay you know a thousand so i would say the the thing that's hard about that is you have to trust your jeweler so you have to know that the jeweler is reputable um that's the first thing because a lot of times you cannot tell um off of your eye one of the key things with moissanite is that moissanite has a little bit more fire which is like um some red and some orange tones when you're outside in the sun and going scientific it's doubly refractive where a diamond is not but that's kind of hard if you don't have a trained eye so for me i always give my clients appraisals so you want to have the appraisal done by an independent person. Um, I know that there are jewelers who do the appraisals themselves, but it kind of defeats the purpose to me because if you buy something from me and it's a sapphire, I'm going to write down sapphire because the vendor that I got it from told me it's a sapphire. That's why you need to have an independent appraisal um, from a gemologist. Um, and so that's what I would say. Um, other than that, because like the diamond testers that people buy on Amazon, it can be faulty because a lot of times those do not test for moissanite. And <clears throat> you have to know how to properly put it because if you put it on the prong, you can get a false positive. So one, trust the jeweler, know that the jeweler that you're going to is reputable. Um, and two, ask for an appraisal. Um, if they don't want to give you an appraisal, you know, it does cost some money, but it is better to get that appraisal. And if they did sell you something that's not correct, you can go back to them with proof because, you know, from my research um, in insurance, everything goes back to proof. What can you prove? What things you have written? So I would say those would be the steps. And you guys, I think somewhere down the line, just stay tuned because we're going to be talking about jewelry. And so now that Natasha, I'm a friend, right? And we are part of the Miami Day Chamber and I have her on here. I'm going to be bothering her. Can you make me the whole Mr. T set for uh, $200? <laughs> I'm going to be one of them clients. Like I want the, I want an OG on gold dish type, you know, stuff. When I say OG, for y'all who have seen the old school movies with Keenan Ivory Waynes, I'm going to get you sucker. That's what I mean. Oh my God, I love that movie. Yeah, I got I to gotta throw it out there because some folks will say, oh, gee, like you making up terms? Nah, man, nothing new <laughs> is under the sun. So with, you know, making this jewelry, how difficult or how annoying is it when clients <laughs> like myself are going to come and say, hey, I want this custom piece, you know, but can you make it within this budget? Like, where should we start when telling you, should we tell you our budget or our idea first? Um, I like to talk about the idea first, because a lot of times the budget is something that could be adjusted um, because gold is like the stock market and the prices go up and down. So depending on the day that you speak to me, we can get it for a certain price. And there's 
certain things that I can do when I'm talking to my designer and say, okay, maybe we could thin it out here or thin it out there. Um, having a realistic budget for what you want is key because you can get something for $500, but is it going to be solid gold? We can make it hollow. We could hollow it out. If that's an option for you, um, we could. That's the soldier boy package. Hollow it out. That's the soldier boy package. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. (laughs) You can hollow it out. And then the issue with hollowing it out is that you do hear it clank. So you have to be comfortable with the clanking noise. Um, We could always resize it. Like if you want something that is maybe two inches, but your budget is around maybe an inch and a half, maybe we can make some changes here and there. Um, And that's where I talk to my designer because he's been doing it for so long where he can tell me, no, we cannot um, decrease it. For example, I have a ring that we're making and I wanted to make it under three grams, but we could not sacrifice without the piece breaking so I had to keep it at like it was around 3.4 originally it was around like 3.7 but you can always decrease it um but the idea first because also for anyone who wants to be a jeweler you want your client to feel like you care about them so if your only focus is well what's your budget you don't your customer would not feel heard and I treat people how I would want to be treated Um, So I wouldn't want to come in and I'm ready to talk about my forever ring. And the person is like, well, what's your budget before we even talk about it? And I have a questionnaire where the budget is the last thing. You know, everything is like, okay, well, can you describe your dream ring? What would you want? Because you don't want that feeling. At least I wouldn't. So that's the way I treat my clients. I love it. I love it because I mean, clients is such a personal relationship and I like to keep relationships. I don't want to just do a one and done. So I feel you on that a hundred percent. Do you have um, any packages or anything for consulting for folks who do want to jump in this game where you can have one-on-one conversations and say, you know what, everybody's situation is different. Some people have kids, some people don't. And this is where I think the learning, you know, steps you should take based on your lifestyle. Yeah, that's a great question. I have not formulated that because um, normally people just ask me questions and I answer it. Um, I know I've heard this. I just learned this word gatekeeping. (laughs) Um, I just learned it on TikTok um, about gatekeeping. I don't know. I personally, I feel like it depends on how in depth the person wants to do it because being one of the very few um, black people in the industry, um, I would just give out information. Like I wouldn't tell you exactly who my vendors are, but I would give you enough information to help you make a decision or do the right thing on Google. Um, Because that part, like a vendor or specifically who I work with, you know, I would, you know, you would have to pay for that. But like basic information on like having a resale license, I would do that if you want to, you know, um, I actually had a guy ask me that he wanted to come in and be mentored. And I told him it would be nominal because I would love to see more black people in the industry. And I think that once I get to a point where I have like a, I have a solid foundation, but like maybe five years where I can teach them tips of like how to get celebrities, things like that, that's more um, feasible besides things that they could just find on social media or find on YouTube. I would be more comfortable charging them for that. But I think right now, and I guess this is game, there's free access to me until I get to that point where I feel like I would charge for it. So if you have questions, you can ask me. You guys can ask questions, says Natasha. Kellen just said after this interview, we're going to find out a system and I'm going to give some game (laughs) to her because everybody, you again, you can't cast your pearls to swine and you can't, you gotta, uh, you know, you have to make a living. And 
when you can put it on auto, you know, McDonald's doesn't sell more hamburgers than everybody else because their system sucks, their system wins. And so they can then help. So that help that you genuinely want to do. And I've had to tell myself this, I thank God for my wife that kicked this into fruition, you know, into fruition. I thank God for also Raru who told me, Kellen, you're doing too much for the price that you offered years ago. And I'm like, really? Okay. Um, so yeah, it's, it's going to kick up. So you guys, when you hear this, watch this, you can try to tune in. Don't be shocked. And you can blame me when she says, check this <laughs> link, check this link out. Cause she's going for sainthood and I am going for purpose. And with that purpose, we got to make sure everybody wins around us. Now, let me ask you with, you know, the best is yet to come. This is fairly still a new business for you. What's a community give back besides giving free advice? What's a community give back you want to do or that you're doing? Um, we kick back that I am doing. Oh, that you well, want to do. Well, I actually, I'm a part of Rotary. And another thing that I really want to do is I want to work with kids. I've always worked with children um, my whole life. Um, and in college, I worked with children. Um, so what I would like to do is just do like a mentorship program with young girls, especially girls who are um, parents are immigrants, because it's a different culture, um, be it even if you're the same language as English, but I'm of Haitian background, but the culture is different. So I would love to mentor immigrant children um, or children of immigrant parents and allow you know them to have a safe space where they could still be Caribbean, but also be black because there's black in America because it is different, especially growing up as a first generation. Definitely, definitely. And if you guys, I can already hear somebody rumbling, say, here we go again with the division. No, there's cultural differences, whether you are in Jamaica or if you are in Tanzania. Um, and that's not, you know, a bad thing. But immigrants, especially in this country, they think different. They don't have time to say what I don't want to do. Money, oh, my night jazz and my Cameroonians understand. They overstand. So it's like we got to get this money. What's going to make the most money and progress while the rest of the folks are studying leisure studies? I'm going to study nursing and, and health care because we got to send money back home, too. So yeah. that you know, that's, that's the difference. So don't, don't feel like, cause I hear too on clubhouse, all this division and it's yeah. usually, it's yeah. usually broke people talking about yeah. stuff. You know, they wish they could change. You are changing the game. I have not yet seen, I know you said you want to do a podcast. I haven't seen a YouTube on our monthly Tuesday meetings. I want you to have jewelry like you did last time. Every time you need to be, hey, my name is Natasha and have something mm -hmm. on you. I, I need to bring that, that out of you. I need to see that because your pieces were beautiful and even the history that you were talking about. But are there any plans to do a YouTube podcast to write a book that you've already written down and set to do? So YouTube is um, something that I want to work on next. I had to get over the fear of what came with being a jeweler. I think that what caused me not to be as open when I first started, even though I'm three years in, I got over the fear early, but I think that it was a lot was like family fears where they're like, don't let people know because you know, you'll be a target, which I know with this industry, I walked into an industry where things are expensive and you have to be careful. Um, but I think having a YouTube is important because one, people who look like us can know that somebody else has done it because I've gotten a lot of that on my social media where they're like, oh my God, I've always wanted to be a jeweler or make jewelry, but I didn't know that someone else did it. And then, you know, not to tune my own horn, but to the level of it being fine jewelry. Um, so it takes people by surprise. And I definitely want to do a YouTube. I definitely, I'm talking about a podcast with a friend um, who does something else in the business world where we'll talk and give young women game about like how to get into the industry, but like 
taking them through the baby steps that like, here's some things that you should have did when you first started, like that I wish I did. Like, what did I want to do looking back? Okay, I should have worked at a, a jewelry store, even if it was like <clears throat> Pandora. So I can have those customer service skills, knowing how to just wrap up something really nice and put it in the bag. Those are things that I would have done. And courses, of course, I see the course like it's a movie. When I see it like that, it I, I, I just see it where it's on auto and you're making money when you sleep, giving them the same thing you're giving people today. And when you talk to them to get into the jewelry game, though, a lot of folks are going to be scared and say, but it is a lot of money I'm going to need. And am I going to need venture capital or, you know, a sponsor? Did you have any of that when you began? And what is a good amount of money to start with if someone's listening and say they want to get involved? I didn't have it because my goal originally was not to become a jeweler of this magnitude. So um, I would say it depends on how you want to do your jewelry business. I'm more a private jeweler concierge. So my clients basically pay for their pieces. Like they pay half the deposit so then they can get their pieces done. So that's what helped me. Um, but I would say if you want to start the way that I did, I would have <clears throat> at least like 20,000 or I mean 10,000, because if you're doing a private jeweler, what you just need is to just get some basic stuff, like a logo made, um, get a website, um, and have money to create custom pieces already like make sample pieces and you can do that in silver so it won't cost a lot and you could always do like different stones that don't cost as much money so instead of doing a diamond maybe you can get a moissanite or even do it in cz so you can just show people like hey this is what i can do because no two diamonds are alike so you can't get you know you can show somebody a diamond they just want to know that you can source it so that's what I would do. So you don't even need 10,000. I would say maybe 5,000. A majority of it is marketing, you know, getting on Instagram. And then when you're on Instagram, maybe going to those community pages of your target audience. The shade room is expensive. So that's like, I would say that's once you're established, but go on to like other smaller um, niche platforms like mine's is black love so I would go to black love pages or you know things like that or if it's if you want to focus on maybe Nigerians you can go to Nigerian pages if you want to focus on Caribbean specifically the Haitians you can go on La Union Suite so there's different ways that you can do it looking back the way that I did it I wouldn't have done it I would have just taken like five thousand dollars start my website get sample pieces and then just showcase them on social media because that's all people want to see. And I definitely hear, I, I, I can hear one of the, the listeners out there. They said, oh, the Haitian piece. What should I do? I don't want to do the typical Haitian flag. Yeah, roll with that idea. I want you to do the, the whole ring or the diamond piece with the picklies. Yeah, we call it the yes. picklies piece with the, with the, oh, with the different colors. I'm giving y'all game. Do that. Send me, send me one. I'll be your matching twin um, and, you know, replace my, my little pieces. But um, I love this game. I want people, like I said, I could do this all day with you. Um, I think maybe the last question I will ask is okay. for those who are really interested in getting involved, would you recommend them also looking into the 3D printing? I have a 3D printer here in my office. Um, and one thing, the, you said this, um, and it's something that I'm advocating. And so it made me think about what I wanted to do because when you asked me that question, one thing that I wanna do and I'm, it's on my to-do list is to introduce jewelry making into the Miami-Dade, at least starting off with the Miami-Dade school system and allow, teenage kids, middle school and high school to know that jewelry making is a possibility for a career. And when you said the 3D printer, it brought back memories 
of like me talking to specific people about it. But for example, when you going through the process, one of the steps is having a 3D print. And there's a guy who, well, there's a couple people, but there's one guy specifically who charged $15 an hour to print it. So all you have to do is just have the state of the art machine that can become castable. So once you have that, let's say it takes four hours, that's $60. And that's one client. If you have three clients a day at $60, that's a lot of money. That's more than some people make working a nine to five that needs a corporate degree. So if you have 10 clients at $60 and that's just for a small ring, you know, if you have a custom piece that could take 27 hours. Um, so I want to showcase that in the industry, it's not only just the person that you see like me um, that makes money. There are stone setters that make money. They charge between one to $3 to set per stone. If it's a big stone, it could be like 10 to $20. Um, you can also um, do casting. Um, so there's different parts of the industry that keeps it going around. You can sell display items. There's a store across from me that all they sell is the items that we need as jewelers. So if you have access to being able to get ring boxes, you can get um, the tissue paper. That's all a part of being in the jewelry industry. And now they're trying to get IT into the jewelry industry because a lot of people wanna try on pieces and we need somebody to code that and you're still a part of the jewelry industry. Um, but yes, I would say invest in 3D printing. Um, 3D printing is good. One thing that I do is I have a ch cheaper one from Amazon so when clients come in, um, cause some people they're okay with just me showing them the computer design and that's it. Some people want to try it on so you can print it locally in your office, have the customer come in, have them, you know, put it on a chain, put it on their finger. And then it's another part of the customer service. You're giving them something that a jewelry store does not do, or another jeweler will not do. And that's, and that's real game. Um, we're going to take it offline, y'all. We're going to talk about Usher's earrings and how he, you know, has them in the middle of his ear. And we're also going to talk about, you know, Iceland because she's one of the few black folks I can bring my my kids and we can all talk about Iceland off air because yeah, she had... Yeah, yeah. You guys got to travel. You got to travel. With every interview that I do, the winners are traveling. You got to have a, a world view to really win. But I don't want to give you an overload of the game. And I do want to save something for when she does make her YouTube and podcast. And we can come back and do this again and again yeah. and again so we can win. So if you guys have any questions, contact Natasha. Natasha, any last words? Um, just follow your dreams. It's going to be nothing that you try that's out of the ordinary is going to be easy, but just keep trying and know that as you're trying, other people see and people will be there to help you. It may not be the person that you expect. My mentor is 75 years old, 74. Um, he's a white guy, Jewish, and I can call him and we can talk about a TV show now because of the relationship that we built, but don't put up walls that you can't learn from anybody. You can learn from almost anybody. And I would never think that someone like him would want to mentor somebody like me. Um, we come from different worlds. He's 74. I'm like in my thirties, but just be open to people who want to see you succeed and um, he's giving me pep talks when I'm down and he's not charging me. So, you know, there are paid mentorships that work. I've had paid mentorships, but you'll find genuine people who want to see you succeed. Um, and if you have to pay for that, that's okay. You know, if that's how you have to start off the relationship, but just know that as you're doing your best, there will be people who will support you. It may not be the person you expect, but it'll be the person that you need. You guys have got the game. 
make sure you share this with somebody. It will change their life. If you like this art behind me and pieces like that, whether it's my shirt that's matching the art, make sure you contact me, whether you want an NFT or physical form, there's utilities behind any NFT that I would ever sell. It's all, you know, privately done. Let's talk. Are you tired of the rat race in America? Are you ready to visit the motherland to relax and rejuvenate? Are you ready to explore all that Africa has to offer? Then check out the brand new Diversified Game Academy course, Prepare for My First Trip to Africa. Are you worried about being able to afford the trip? We got you. We will show you how to travel either on a budget or as a baller. Learn how to stress the value of the USD. Did you know that 100 United States dollars is worth over 1,000 South African Rand or 10,000 Kenyan shillings? or 54,250 West African CFA. Are you worried about taking your kids? Get the game from Kellen Cash, a bona fide world traveler, having traveled to almost 20 countries, several of those in Africa. Get the game on taking your kids on their first trips. Learn how to find the best tickets, get the visas, and plan your own adventures in Africa. Don't let Eddie Murphy have all the fun. Plan your own coming to Africa trip starring you, produced by you, and featuring you. If you are ready for a life-changing experience, sign up for our course today, Diversified Game Academy. Get prepared and purchase at DiversifiedGame.com.